Thank you very much. And uh, for those of you who have only just arrived in uh, Slovakia, welcome to Bratislava. And uh, I'm personally looking forward very much to this first morning session. So it is a, it's a real privilege and a pleasure for me uh, to introduce this year's speaker uh, for the James Reed Memorial Lecture. There probably are enough uh, newbies and younger people who have absolutely no idea who James Reed is, so I thought I should just briefly mention him. Uh, he was an English general practitioner, uh, and in the early 1980s, I guess with a small band of uh, visionary doctors and informaticians, he saw the potential value, I think initially really for primary care, of encodifying the things that go on in a health care professional's head and to use that to drive um, safety, performance, um, and better care uh, for patients uh, who came to see him. And, and that system of encodification uh, has developed into the thing we have today. Um, on Wednesday, Betsy Humphreys, I think, very movingly sort of painted the broader picture of how read terms and the work that was done by the College of, uh, of American Pathologists came together into the thing we know as SNOMED CT. Uh, and I personally think it's a miracle that we have got as far as we have. But I would look at you as a group of intellectuals, of thinkers, of innovators, and say the job is really not done. Um, there is a tremendous amount of work to do, and it is really urgent that we finish it. And the reason for that is that if you're a patient, and I, you know, if I look at this room of 100, 150, 200 people, There'll be somebody in the room who is a diabetic, might be an epileptic, maybe is on an anticoagulant for a, heart, a rhythm disorder and so on. And the things that can make a profound difference to you as an individual is having access to your data wherever you are. So if you're stuck in, uh, in Slovakia and something goes wrong, the ability to get that information and share it with people can make a profound difference to your safety as an individual and to the quality of the care that you get. So it's with real pleasure that uh, I can introduce a doctor who has made those kind of changes, introduced those kinds of systems in uh, Canada. So our speaker today is Jeremy Thiel. Uh, he's uh, a gastroenterologist who trained in Toronto uh, he uh, does, still does, I believe, endoscopy. Uh, he's interested, he tells me this morning, in the effects of potato on the bowel movement. So if any of you are stuck, he, uh, see him after class and he'll help you. Um, I think there are a couple of things I ought to say about Jeremy, which I think um, are, are just part of uh, the way we all learn. He is ludicrously young for, for the achievements that he's made so far. I'm now an older person, uh, and he's achieved about six times as much as I have uh, in half the time. So that's a bit frustrating, but it's a fantastic thing. The other thing is he's a Canadian, and that's generally, I guess, a good thing. But <laughs> First of all, he's a subject of our queen, so you know, that's uh, top marks to him. Uh, but secondly, I think he represents the value of this group. It's a global community of thinkers, uh, and Canada, I think, is charging ahead with the delivery of new ways of thinking, new ways of delivering healthcare, and making patients safe as a result of the use of terminologies. He is going to tell us about the delivery of an e-care system uh, in North York Hospital in North Toronto, which is where he works, 
But I think it'll spread also into the work that he's been doing most recently in developing uh, CPOE systems for the whole of the InfoWay system. He'll tell us about the guidebook and, uh, and plans that, Canada uh, that he's developed with Canadian staff in InfoWay to live a real change. And I think he's an example of the new doctor, of the doctor who is self-aware and self-questioning and realizes that particularly now, with an invention of specialties in my lifetime uh, that are completely uh, new. So when I qualified, immunology was a baby science. Uh, virtually nobody in the world had had a bone marrow transplant. Uh, genomics was not applied, uh, wasn't known about. Nobody knew how to split the human genome. And we simply, as human beings, can't remember all of that stuff all at once and make sensible decisions for our patients. With the sort of tools that Jeremy has implemented in his set of hospitals, where unwanted variation has been, I would it's probably exaggerating to say it's been eliminated by uh, the things he's put in, but it, it, care has been standardized and I think he has great data to show the effects on patient safety, the, pa the effects on the ability to support doctors, nurses, and all healthcare professionals in uh, making good, valued, and shared decisions uh, with patients. So with no further ado, I welcome Jeremy Thiel to the stage, and thank you very much for coming all this way. Thank you, Jeremy. Good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for the warm introduction. Any introduction that includes the, includes the phrase bowel movement makes me feel right at home, so I appreciate that very much. Uh, thank you also to the organizing committee for the honor of having me uh, come here today and share uh, some uh, interesting perspectives from Canada. And I hope you en enjoy uh, the presentation and looking forward to your questions afterwards as well. Um, what I'd like to talk about today, I, I'm going to uh, be right up front with you that I am not an expert in terminology. That is uh, to you in this group, and uh, uh, I have the utmost respect for all the work that you do. Uh, what I'm going to share today is more uh, the delivery of, uh, of the terminology that you have been uh, so heavily involved with. Uh, that last mile, if you will, of getting it to the front line of clinical care and some of the challenges that we face in, in achieving that uh, and, and yet how important it really is uh, to the patient, as was mentioned in the introduction. Uh, so, uh, firstly, I'd like to start with a very brief uh, overview of some of the work that's going on uh, with SNOMED CT in Canada. Um, then I'd like to go on to um, some examples from our hospital, uh, which is, a, I think, a fairly typical uh, community teaching hospital in Canada. Uh, some of the challenges that we've faced over the years in trying to get to uh, get this terminology being used uh, at the front line um, in the past as well as the present. But then I'd like to move into uh, talking about some very interesting things that are going to happen in the very near future in our province, really zooming out to that 30,000-foot view of what might be possible when and using um, SNOMED CT at a provincial level uh, to improve quality and standardization. Um, so I'm going to start uh, by sharing uh, a parental reference. I have a three and a half year old at home and I've discovered uh, after being a CMIO for almost a decade, so Chief Medical Information Officer, uh, that there are some parallels between the two. Um, so, uh, my daughter, unfortunately, uh, she doesn't like eating her vegetables. She knows that the vegetables are good for her, but she doesn't enjoy it. And this is very uh, similar, in, in fact, to uh, physicians trying to get them to use um, encoded data rather than free text at the front line. They know it's good for them, they understand there's some benefit, but it's just not fun, it takes more time, so mm, not going to do it. Uh, and uh, although I have the utmost, utmost respect for my colleagues as professionals in medicine, um, sometimes when they're forced to do things they don't like, uh, they can have temper tantrums, very similar to uh, what I might see with my daughter. So there are definitely some parallels there uh, with parenting. Um, however, if we can really persuade uh, our colleagues to, to, to really embrace uh, the use of vegetables every day, and I'm, I'm sure you're all craving vegetables after this week, uh, there are many benefits. Um, uh, it can be a little messy, but we can get some great results. So uh, I'll share uh, how that works. 
Uh, first, a little bit about uh, the Canadian landscape. Uh, the uh, Canada Health Infoway, of course, is a real powerhouse in bringing Snowman CT forward to, uh, to the, uh, the, the developers, the informaticians, and the users in our country. Uh, they really advocate for Snowman CT uh, being used uh, in clinical care, and uh, as a CMIO, the first time I heard about Snowman CT was, was from Canada Health Infoway over 10 years ago. Um, as you probably know, they maintain the Canadian edition in English and French um, for SNOMED CT and provide access to uh, people in our country uh, via license agreement. Um, they support and educate uh, our users and developers, everything from providing mapping tools to a virtual community to uh, share between users in the country. Uh, they also manage all the requests for uh, changes and updates to the terminology in Canada, and they have a number of uh, custom Canadian subsets that they've developed as well, uh, particularly a lot of work going on in the immunization subset, as you may have uh, seen in the presentation yesterday around the, uh, the uh, immunization app uh, that has been active in Canada, as well as the Panorama system, uh, which both use the immunization SNOMED CT subset. Um, but when we talk about hospitals in Canada, we still have a big challenge trying to get SNOMED CT to the front line. And when you review the literature, uh, and I apologize, I've started with the bottom of my slide and not the top, but there's a reason for that, uh, is that um, really the experience is um, there are very few known SNOMED CT implementations in a hospital setting particularly in Canada, and in my work um, that I do at a provincial and national level, which I'll share with you later, uh, I've been involved in more than 100 different organizations in our country, and I can tell you that this, uh, what's reflected in the literature is certainly the truth, that, uh, that it's actually a rarity to have hospitals um, implement SNOMED CT in their frontline work. So why is that? There's a lot of challenges. Um, one of the first challenges is that uh, pretty much all the hospital information system vendor software that we use in Canada is made in the United States. Um, when the United States companies come up in, into Canada, um, they don't particularly espouse a certain um, terminology to be used, and if anything, uh, they'll probably just default to ICD-10-CA uh, because that's uh, usually what's used at least administratively. Um, and so, uh, unless an organization specifically asks uh, for SNOMED CT as part of their implementation, it won't necessarily be brought forward. The second is that there's a lot of confusion around the, the different uh, national extensions. And so in Canada, in our hospital, when we started using SNOMED CT, our hospital information system vendor actually provided us the UK edition. And we were using that for several years without being aware of it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was only just recently that we uh, kind of put our, uh, our, um, uh, our vendor's head to the grinder and said, this isn't right. And now we finally have the Canadian edition. I mean, we, we love the British diphthongs, don't get me wrong. I mean, esophagus with an OE is, is quite uh, beautiful in its own way, but uh, it's, it, it's uh, and yes, I am a subject of the Queen, but uh, it's not how we spell things in Canada. So uh, we were very happy to finally have our own edition uh, brought forward to our hospital, uh, but certainly some confusion still happens there. The other thing is that really at an organizational uh, and leadership level in our hospitals, um, there's a very poor appreciation and understanding for, uh, for why uh, these terminologies are so important, and in particular why SNOMED CT uh, is, is unique and important to be used in clinical care as opposed to something like ICD-10-CA. Um, and so because there's a lack of uh, understanding uh, amongst our hospital leaders who are the ones who are actually making the decisions to implement our new electronic systems, unless somebody comes and educates them about the importance of this, uh, it often doesn't get highlighted. And people are so busy just trying to get to the end of their project implementing these advanced systems, which are at high risk, uh, of course, for, uh, for not being successful. Uh, they're mostly focused on just getting the software up and running and clinicians using it without looking at the importance of um, data standardization and the, uh, the improvements that that can provide. Um, the other issue, of course, is that the vendor software is not particularly friendly to creating a workflow that enables clinicians to use um, SNOMED CT in, a, in an efficient fashion. So uh, being able to have uh, a search module that works in a way that uh, clinicians think eliminates some of the complexity around SNOMED CT and presents terms that are clinically relevant to what that clinician is thinking uh, can be a real challenge um, and sometimes that uh, sort of limits the ability of the content to be used. One of the ways that hospitals may get around that is just allowing free text entries and in some of the data you may see uh, coming out of uh, uh, Canada or, or elsewhere, uh, it's up to 50% or even higher uh, of the terms that clinicians enter are free text, which of course really uh, starts to hamstring the ability of us to be able to use this data in a meaningful way. 
And lastly, there is still some user frustration. And I know that, uh, of course, SNOMED CT is improving in leaps and bounds. And uh, some of the uh, earlier frustrations, perhaps 10 years ago, around uh, the sheer volume of concepts, being able to filter them correctly, um, missing synonyms or redundant terms have uh, constantly been improving. But this is still feedback that I get from my physicians uh, when they're trying to use this terminology. So it is still a challenge today. So um, I'm going to take you now to our hospital and share uh, some of the experiences that we've had. Um, uh, we are a community uh, a teaching hospital affiliated with the University of Toronto. Uh, so we're not a full-fledged academic centre, but we do have residents, uh, uh, medical students and fellows that come through our, our doors. Uh, we're quite a busy place, 426 acute care beds with 124,000 emergency visits annually and about 31,000 inpatient cases. We've been a HIMSS Analytics Stage 6 hospital since 2011, so we've been in the forefront of implementation uh, in, in Canada. And I think um, perhaps uh, more important to us as an organization is to meaningfully change and improve the quality of care that we provide. This is not just about technology. In fact, the primary goal is improving care. And that's why I'm very happy to say that we were recipients of the uh, Davies Enterprise Award from HIMSS last year. For those of you not familiar with this award, um, it's been uh, in place actually since the late 1980s. And it specifically identifies hospitals who have been able to meaningfully improve care with statistically significant data uh, for patients and also simultaneously be able to provide a financial return on investment by leveraging electronic health systems. And uh, uh, as of 2016, only about 50 organizations in the world have ever won this award. So we were very, very uh, honored to uh, be in that company. So a little bit about our uh, information system project. We dubbed it eCare, which started uh, over 10 years ago now, back in 2007. Uh, and these were the various components. So yes, we were implementing an advanced electronic health record system that would enable things like computerized provider order entry, closed loop medication management, uh, electronic medication uh, uh, administration record, um, all the, the necessary pieces and parts to improve safety and quality, and also clinical decision support, both static and dynamic. Um, the kickoff was in 2007, and over the years we've been implementing in phases in the different parts of our hospital. We've been hospital-wide now since 2015. The goals of our project, first and foremost, this was not a technology project. This was a clinical transformation project, and that's the way we framed it to our clinicians. Um, so yes, uh, this was a, a quality and safety project that just happened to be using technology as opposed to a technology project that just happened to, to be improving quality and safety. We also wanted to make sure that we built into the DNA of this project the use of standardized data to be able to enable uh, um, clinical and business intelligence uh, to improve care both at the front line and also at the administrative level. We wanted to transition the culture of our organization as well. At the beginning of 2007, when I started in my role, um, our physicians tended to be quite individualistic in the way that they practiced, which means that they weren't necessarily having an open conversation with one another about what is the best evidence for the care that I might be providing. If I have a patient with ulcerative colitis, uh, what treatment would I use for, for this patient versus another? Um, physicians usually just kind of did their own thing and didn't talk even amongst their department about how could we standardize the care, what would be the most appropriate um, treatment for this type of patient. So we really wanted to open the dialogue more as we designed this system to get clinicians into rooms talking together about if we're going to standardize care, what should that standard be? We also wanted to make it easy to do the right thing because although it can be uh, wonderful to create a new workflow that perhaps improves quality and safety, if it takes an extra 10 minutes per patient, physicians unfortunately won't use it, even if you beat them with a stick. So we need a process which is not only the best for the patient, but also is the most efficient workflow. And if we are able to create that, we can actually have a workflow that becomes the default way of doing things without having any penalties or bonuses necessary. Um, and it just becomes the way uh, that things are done. And we wanted this project to be a, a by clinicians and for clinicians. So we really wanted clinicians to understand that this system was for them and for their patients. This was not a technology project that was being designed by uh, informaticians in a back room not talking to clinicians, but rather informaticians working in partnership with clinicians to design the best possible system. 
Uh, now, along with this project, because we were trying to leverage standardized data, uh, it was important for us to consider what, me what might be some of the success factors in trying to implement standardized terminology and transition physicians from free text uh, to something more meaningful. Um, if we, when we reviewed the literature, we found there were six main factors. One is that we need to we need to create simplicity. And um, of course, Snowman CT, because of how flexible and how comprehensive it is, um, by necessity, it becomes complex. But when our physicians use the system, they tell us they want something as simple as a Google search. So how do you balance the complexity and the flexibility with the simplicity that's necessary for efficient use? That's something we had to address. Our clinicians need to understand why. If they're going to change their workflow, they need to understand why it's important to change that workflow and what it might mean for their care. They also need to see what the value is going to be. So what is a clinically relevant statement that I can share about using standardized terminology that is going to matter to our physicians? Um, having reference sites, so being able to point to other hospitals that have been successful in this work and perhaps borrow a few pages from their playbook rather than trying to implement this from scratch is also helpful. Um, training, of course, is important. The system needs to be uh, uh, clear so that people know how to use it, but at the same time, if it takes an extra hour of training just to be able to use standardized terminology, that contravenes point one, is, uh, which is that it needs to be simple. So, uh, yes, a little bit of training is important, but if you're doing a lot of training, probably something's wrong with your system design. And lastly, we need the partnership of our vendors, because um, if we don't have a system that supports um, uh, efficient and uh, accurate use of a standardized terminology, then chances are we're going to end up with either poor adoption or poor quality data. So in terms of helping our physicians understand the why, there were several things that I tried to message to our frontline docs to help them understand why it may be valuable for them to use um, SNOMED CT. Um, first of all, I, I tried to explain, uh, many of our clinicians do understand ICD-9 or ICD-10-CA because they use uh, that, for example, for their billing, or they may use it in their primary care offices because the government does track uh, patients by uh, that type of um, uh, terminology. Uh, but so it's, it's to help them understand, first of all, this is not the same thing. This is something that's really designed for frontline clinical use. It's much more granular, uh, much more comprehensive and flexible. Um, and it's really designed to be used by the frontline clinicians. So I, I also try to explain to them that if they're providing um, it, it, the necessary coded data as part of their care of the patient in the hospital, that's a much higher quality data set than what you might get from post-coding by analysts that happen when the patient gets discharged home, where often they have to make um, several assumptions from the free text data that might be in a consult note or a discharge summary, and sometimes they don't always make the right inferences. Um, and also, because we can cross-map SNOMED CT to ICD-10-CA, and ICD-10-CA is what we use for um, funding for our hospital, then if the clinician is very robust in the way that they provide the data on all the different things that happen to that patient and the comorbidities that they have, it actually translates to better funding for our hospital. And this is something I was quite surprised that our physicians really, uh, they really resonated with this idea that, hey, if I can do a little bit of extra work, I don't mind doing that if that means that our hospital is gonna get more, uh, fu more fair funding allocation uh, because they know that that is going to translate to being able to provide better care for future patients. So um, it was really quite interesting to see how they were willing to do a little bit of extra work if it meant that that could be possible. We also need to change the channel. So what often happens when I bring this content to physicians and I say, well, you know, as you're going to be doing your clinical documentation, you're going to be presented with a search box and you need to enter uh, some clinical terms that match the, the past medical history of the patient, um, they often say, well, wait a minute, that's going to be a whole lot of clicks. I don't want to do that. And um, I think we need to change the channel from, well, how many clicks does this particular individual task take? And, and really zoom out to that uh, 10 or 30,000 foot view to say, during the whole journey of that patient in the hospital, and the next time they come back to the hospital in future, what are the benefits of that um, brief additional time uh, that you need to spend in getting that past medical history encoded at the first visit? And when they start to understand that there is a pay it forward structure here, that by having that, um, that discrete data in the system at the beginning of that patient's admission, that then all, uh, all the consult notes, all of the discharge summaries that, uh, that are being done are going to leverage that list. It's going to be pulled forward and just needs to be updated and modified rather than re-entered. 
This provides value for them because in current state, they have to, when, a, when they see a new patient, they're basically mining through all of these free text uh, con dictated uh, consult notes and discharge summaries to try and find all the details of the past medical history, which tend to be sprinkled in different ways through different notes. So it, this actually saves them a lot of time once that is, is brought forward. Also, that problem list is going to be carried between hospital visits. So the next time that patient comes back, well, hopefully they don't have to, but if they do, that content is going to be available to them. Uh, things like physician handover lists as well, uh, the way our vendor software is configured, it actually provides that problem list face up to the physicians as they hand over care from one physician to another. So these are some tangible clinical benefits. Then, of course, there's a the benefit of clinical decision support, and I'm going to show you some examples of some real-time clinical decision support that we've been able to leverage off of um, SNOMED CT. Um, longitudinal support. So as a gastroenterologist, I care about polyps, for example. So um, having a system that is able to encode past uh, family history of polyps or cancer, or encode that this patient themselves has a history of adenomatous polyps, for example, can help us prov uh, provide decision support around when that patient may need to come back for further screening, and also allows us to uh, assess quality. At a population level, if we have accurately encoded diagnoses um, throughout our hospital for our patients, we're then able to leverage population health management um, to better understand how we can um, use our resources to look after patients on a daily basis at a facility, regional, and provincial level. And then finally, of course, having this encoded data allows us to be able to uh, run uh, queries of all different sorts to support research, quality improvement, and resource management. So this is the, the laundry list of things that I try to tell clinicians to help them understand why they would want to use SNOMED CT, why it's important to eat your vegetables, as it were. Um, but this is the challenge that I face. So when I first started to share this messaging with our clinicians 10 years ago, this, the, the vendor software, and I heard someone mumbling which uh, vendor this is, I'm not going to say it out loud, but um, uh, the, the problem was, even though I had built up this wonderful use case for why we should all use SNOMED at the front lines of care, the vendor software that we had to use to actually uh, encode this data in the chart was horrendous. Um, and so if I typed hypertension into this search box, I would get perhaps five do dozen different uh, options for all the different forms of hypertension when all I was looking for was essential hypertension. There was no way for me to favorite certain diagnoses so that I could bubble up the most commonly used diagnoses rather than having to manually search every time. And so we, we clocked our physicians, and unfortunately it was taking about 12 seconds on average per diagnosis to be able to search, find, and add this structured content to the patient's chart. If you consider that the average age of our patients in our hospital is now somewhere up in the 80s, and many of them have perhaps 10 or 12 comorbidities, this is simply an untenable proposition to expect our physicians to be able to uh, enter this content on every single patient. The other thing is that because this interface was so laborious, our clinicians really felt that this was a clerical exercise and not really part of their clinical workflow, even though technically on paper they were already listing off the past medical issues for a particular patient. Um, this felt much more um, like a coding process to them and they weren't really uh, on board with that. And to compound matters further, um, this search box was not part of the documentation workflow in the system. So a clinician actually had to stop what they were doing and go, oh yeah, I have to encode my diagnoses, I have to go eat my vegetables, go into the special search box and start searching and adding. Uh, so we got less than 1% adoption at this point. Um, I can remember one very special internal medicine specialist in our hospital who was so enamored with this uh, ability to encode data. Uh, he would actually go in and find all the diagnoses. He would nest them and show relationships between them. He would print off the, this beautiful list of coded diagnoses, cut it out of a piece of paper, and actually tape it on the face sheet of the chart. He was a very special man, but he was by no means uh, what we, we would expect from our regular clinicians. So uh, he was our poster child for sure, but wasn't enough to get adoption. So uh, the reality was that other than being able to provide a good use case for the why of why we should use SNOMED CT, I did not have a simple uh, workflow for them to, to use. I was not able to demonstrate value because we didn't have adoption. There weren't any reference sites in Canada where we were using SNOMED CT on our vendor. Um, the training was too complicated and the vendor wasn't really cooperating with providing a better workflow. So I was kind of stuck. So we took a different tack. 
as you remember, the goal of our project was to make it easy to do the right thing, and we had some toddlers who didn't want to eat their vegetables. So we thought, well, what if we could build Snowman CT into the daily clinical workflow without people realizing that they were even using it? So it's kind of like sneaking vegetables into a kid's diet. If you put veggies on the pizza, all of a sudden people want to use, they want to eat their veggies, right? So what we decided to do was change our tack and said, well, if the documentation side of the workflow is not working, perhaps we could actually switch to the ordering side and see what, um, see what leverage we could get from that point of view. So, what you're looking at here is a piece of an order set. Um, very, very core to the way that we did our work at North York General was we built, we standardized care by building standardized order sets that were condition specific. We built over 350 of these for our first go live and we continued to expand that library over time. And the reason why we did that is because the literature is very clear that if you build evidence into the workflow of the physician so that at the time and point of decision making, they have the evidence presented to them that it is relevant to the decision they are about to make, it's much more likely that the evidence will be used. And that was shown in particular in the meta-analysis published by Kawamoto back in 2005 in the BMJ. So that was really the paradigm we used with our system design. Is, so what you're looking at here is a piece of an order set for pneumonia. And it's the section of the order set that the physician would use to select empiric antibiotics for a patient. Now when physicians first think about order sets, they think, well, this is cookbook medicine. My patients are not widgets. I don't want to use standardized care. So we had to change the channel on that conversation and explain to them that actually order sets are a way of creating um, evidence-based guardrails to prevent you from perhaps selecting a treatment that would be harmful to a patient and rather direct you to uh, choices that are evidence-based and are beneficial to the patient but in, in addition to that you are creating a bespoke treatment plan for that patient because you are considering the evidence that pertains to your individual patient, the risk factors, the comorbidities, the history that they have, and then selecting the appropriate diagnosis. So what you can see is that this section of the, uh, of the order set for choosing an empiric antibiotic is actually quite text heavy, and that's on purpose. Because a patient, for example, may have a beta-lactam allergy, or they may have been previously exposed to a different class of antibiotics in the past three months. Maybe they have aspiration pneumonia. Maybe they have risk factors for pseudomonas. Maybe they're a nursing home or a long-term care resident. All of these things affect the choice of antibiotics that you would use. So, by presenting face-up text in the order set that helps guide the clinician to the correct customized treatment for their patient, we both standardize and personalize the care. And these uh, red circled areas that I'm showing you here, um, uh, I, I, do not, I do not thank our vendor for what this icon is supposed to look like. It's like 8-bit, but it, it's, I think what it's supposed to show is a little page with a chain link on it. It's supposed to be a little pun for a web link. But when you click on that, it actually, we have built into our system evidence summaries. So if the clinician is trying to make a decision, sees the one, one sentence face-up statement that is guiding them to a certain choice, but they don't really believe in that choice, they can click on the evidence link and it will provide them a summary of all the studies that back up that statement. And then by clicking on the hot links that are in this table, I can actually go right to the primary literature. And we've also linked our full text subscription journals from our library to the PubMed link. So from the point of decision making to the primary article that underpins that decision, it's only a couple of clicks away. And this content is being updated on a regular basis. We have a system in place where as new content becomes available that's not published in our system, our build tool actually shows that there's new evidence available that we can then review with our clinicians and quickly get into the system. So in summary, what we created here was something very special that helped our, our physicians become more super in providing care to our patients and that the benefits actually are very tangible and that if you're able to build the evidence into the workflow, um, the evidence that I'm showing here uh, is that we can, we can actually save lives, we can reduce um, potential complications in hospital, um, and we can improve the quality uh, of our care. So this was uh, a, a poster campaign that we used very, uh, just very um, close to our go-live date to build positive excitement around what this project means for clinicians and patients. And also a subliminal message that we understand you're going to need to be super to change the way that you work. This is a very different way of working than you used to, but that the outcomes can also be super. 
And perhaps the second subliminal message is, if my chief of medicine is willing to stand up in front of the whole hospital in his underwear, there must be something good about this project. So on the right here, these are not uh, random heads. These are actually people from our hospital. This is our chief of medicine on the right. On the left, this is our chief nursing officer. We had some other posters. We had a pharmacist. We had a social worker. We had a nurse, etc., cetera, uh, to help everybody understand that we're all in this together. So we actually got 100% of adoption of our system, and we were also able to show that um, compared to our paper order set process, where perhaps only about 35% of our patients were getting a standardized uh, order set on admission, in our electronic system now over 97% of our patients are getting a standardized order set on admission to hospital. So because we now have this great adoption and we have people using standardized order sets, now I can actually leverage some workflow that allows me to stealth in some SNOMED CT without people realizing it. So what we did was we built decision support that is based on the order set that was selected on it at the time of admission. So this pop-up that I'm showing you is when a physician chose to use a congestive heart failure order set on admission to hospital. And it just pops up an alert that says, hey, it seems like your patient has congestive heart failure. Do any of these three diagnoses apply to your patient? And so at the bottom here, there's a checklist, and basically the physician just selects one of these terms and clicks OK. Little do they know that they're actually using SNOMED C CT encoded data and that that's actually going to the problem list of the chart. To them, it just seems like a very quick, oh, well, this is part of my workflow. I'm thinking about the patient and their diagnosis. I don't have to go and search anything. It's just presented to me. The other thing we did, oh, and I should point out that, so here is the, uh, the problem list in the system that you can see the SNOMED CT term is actually encoded as a result of, of filling out this checkbox. But we also pulled, put in comorbidities. So we know that patients with congestive heart failure often have other comorbidities, such as atherosclerotic heart disease, hypertension, dyslipidemia, smoking history, et cetera. So again, a, a second box is presented to the physician saying, do any of these other comorbidities apply to this particular patient? And again, it's a very quick one or two second thing to tick off a couple of boxes and click OK, and that is also going to the problem list. So by doing this, we were able to get from under 1% adoption to about 15% of our patients having encoded data on their chart. It's certainly not the um, holy grail, but it's a good start in the right direction. What else were we able to do? Well, the next thing we did was um, in, our, uh, in, in specific areas of our hospital, such as endoscopy, urology, and diabetes care, um, we actually had a funded project by Canada Health Infoway um, to regionally create some standardized templates for documentation that were used in several hospitals in our province. And as part of that, we partnered with Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, which has already done a lot of work in synoptic reporting and SNOMED CT, uh, to then actually figure out, well, how can we build SNOMED CT into the uh, documentation process without removing clinicians from the workflow or taking extra time for searching. So what we did here uh, at the bottom of the screen here is um, this is a colonoscopy template and at the bottom of the template where the physician would usually dictate in their uh, impression and plan what diagnoses do I think this patient has, um, it's actually just a clickable list of all the different diagnoses that are typically encountered when you do a colonoscopy. And each of these clickable items is actually encoded in the background in SNOMED CT and is automatically added to the problem list. So again, this is kind of a stealth method. Physicians aren't searching anything. They don't even really know they're using an encoded terminology. But by selecting the diagnosis, which they need to do anyway, it does um, drive that information to the chart. And in fact, we've made this a, a, a mandatory field. So it's impossible to sign your note until you have completed this section. Um, so similarly with gastroscopy, we've got uh, basically a sorted list from esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. You can see esophagus is spelled without an O. Apologies to our British colleagues. Uh, stomach and duodenum, et cetera, uh, and all the clickable diagnoses. And then again for ERCPs, uh, so endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, for those who don't know the short form. Um, uh, this is one of the procedures that I do. Um, we have the diagnoses, but also interventions that are part of the procedural uh, subtype um, in SNOMED CT. So uh, that data is also encoded. Um, so as a result, we were able to get from about 15% of our patients to about 30% of our patients now having encoded data in their chart. Um, and now we're able to leverage that encoded data for analytics. So one of the things that we're able to do is now create a report from those endoscopy uh, notes that allows us to see what percentage of um, patients for that particular surgeon uh, have polyps been found. And why is this important? Well, it's because 
um, there's a quality standard based on the literature that shows that if you're not finding about 30% of your patients have polyps when you do a colonoscopy, chances are you're looking too, you're looking too quickly. You're probably going in and out of the, the colon so fast that you're missing polyps. So um, you can see here that there's a quite a bit of variation between some of the surgeons in this report. Some people are getting upwards of almost 40% of their patients have polyps, and some are way down around 13%. So this helps us go back to our physicians and say, hey, there's a practice standard here that you might want to be aware of, and based on this encoded data, you may need to look at either you're screening too many patients who are low risk, and they don't need to be screened because you're not finding polyps, so stop scoping 20-year-olds, or you're going in and out of the colon so fast that you're missing polyps. So this is really helpful data to have. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've started to leverage encoded data in the chart in, com in, in, in combination with drug data in the chart uh, to do um, disease drug interaction clinical decision support. So this one is near and dear to the heart of my wife because she's a geriatrician and one of her main focuses is looking after patients with Parkinson's disease. And one of the difficulties with patients who have Parkinson's or Lewy body dementia is that um, they, may get, they may get agitated in the hospital. And typically when a, patient, when a physician is on call in the middle of the night and they get a call from a nurse saying, hey, this patient's agitated, they're waking up the other patients, they're gonna hurt themselves, the physician will order some form of antipsychotic to try and calm that patient down. But the on-call physician might not be aware that that patient has Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia. And most of the antipsychotics, if you prescribe to this particular patient group, uh, is actually potentially harmful and can even, even actually kill patients. Um, and so uh, this uh, real-time decision support uses encoded data to be able to remind the physician that if they try to, pr uh, to prescribe an antipsychotic and the system knows that that patient has Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia, it pops up this alert to say, maybe you should reconsider your decision. Also because we have encoded data, and the reason why we expect our physicians to pay attention to our uh, clinical decision support alerts is because we're watching them, and they know that. So we actually have some physician scorecards that we're able to generate from the coded data in the system. What we're looking at here is a comparison between our cardiologists and our general hospitalists to see what the parameters of care are for patients with congestive heart failure. And what, what's interesting is that um, when a generalist looks after a patient with heart failure, the average length of stay is 7.6 days, but if a cardiologist looks after that patient, it's only 6.6 days. And in addition to that, um, we're finding that the readmission rate is different between the two groups. So this be, may be able to help us understand the differences in practice between different types, types of practitioners and help them learn from one another to be able to further improve care. So now that we've done all that great stuff, um, I'm now able to go back because the success factor list that I showed you earlier, now we've been able to sort of change the equation a little bit. And also on top of that, our vendor has finally, finally, finally created something that allows a better workflow for clinical documentation where there's actually a more efficient search algorithm um, that can be used for SNOMED CT. And because we've been able to reflect back to our physician population some of the value that we've already been able to create by having encoded data, they have real world examples now of why using this data and encoding it may be important at the point of care. So in our new approach, we have a clinically focused problem list that has a search algorithm that's much simpler to use. It filters the top 10 choices that match a search string, and it's usually based on the preferred term or the, uh, the synonym because it's simpler to read. Um, and it limits the concept types to things that would be relevant to a problem list because what we're doing is we're creating a past medical history here. So finding disorder, procedure, observable entity is fine, but we're not gonna go into other um, subtypes of concepts. Um, we piloted this with 10 physicians and then we're rolling it out specialty by specialty. Now, interestingly, in order to be able to generate a discharge summary for patients, they actually have to have an encoded problem list. It's the only way to actually be able to list problems. And the other thing we did, which was a little bit uh, cavalier, or not cavalier, but risky in terms of adoption, is we said there, there will be no free text entries. So it's not possible to actually enter a problem in the problem list unless you're using a SNOMED CT term. Now, we still allow physicians to enter comments on any of the terms if they need to provide additional color to that information, but uh, the, the free text terms are not allowed. 
Now, there are still some challenges. This is not a perfect, uh, not a panacea yet. So here's an example of where I searched for cirrhosis. And it, yes, it, it gave me the top 10 choices, but there are a lot of different types of cirrhosis. Uh, and there are many listed in SNOMED CT. What I was looking for was an unspecified or not yet diagnosed, which was very difficult to find, even when I tried to uh, add different uh, nuances to my search string. So in this particular case, I had to go back to the old interface to find something that made sense. But for the most part, this does work pretty pretty well, for the common diagnoses especially. There is still a little bit of a risk here of miscoding because we're not allowing physicians to enter any free text data, and if they're getting a little frustrated with the top 10 list, they may be selecting something which is not quite exactly what they're trying to find, but they're not going to spend an extra two minutes trying to find it. So that is a little bit of a recognized downside to this approach. Um, the other issue is there's no support for post-coordination of terms. This is a recurring theme, of course. So if I have, for example, osteoarthritis of the knee, and I want to be able to indicate that it's only in the left knee, I basically have to add that as a, as a comment because the interface doesn't really allow me to post-coordinate those terms. Um, but we have been able to get 100% adoption amongst our pilot physicians. So um, the overall workflow for documentation is valuable enough to them that, they, that the, the balance of the equation is, hey, we're going to do this. Um, they really like the fact that once this problem list is in the system, it's available to everybody else for physician handover, for consultants, uh, for con consultations, as well as for uh, discharge. So um, that's where we are today. And I want to talk about some of the results of implementing our system. Um, Back in 2012, uh, the Toronto Star, which is a fairly wi widely read newspaper in our province, um, actually published a positive story about healthcare. This only happens about once every five years. It's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's actually quite unusual. Usually it's, it's all the scandal. Um, but in this case, there was a good news story. And what they were saying is that the Canadian Institute for Health Information, or CAIHI, um, found that the number of preventable deaths in Toronto area hospitals were going significantly uh, down, which is an improvement. They also cited in the article that North York General, our hospital, was the top performer in the Greater Toronto Area, uh, which has about 8 million citizens, um, and the second best in all of Canada. And this was a real eye-opener for us because we were definitely not anywhere near the top before we started this electronic project. Now, our CEO at the time says, well, this is because of health information technology. We've hardwired quality and safety into the care that we provide. And, of course, we should always believe everything our CEO says, but we decided to fact-check that. So what we did is a study, and I'm going to explain the study in a moment, but first I need to under, uh, explain some terms to you. HSMR stands for Hospital Standardized Mortality Ratio, and this is used in Canada to compare one hospital to another in terms of a surrogate for quality of care. What this tracks is the number of preventable deaths in one hospital versus another. Now, it's corrected for comorbidities, age, etc. Um, and what it means is that if you have a score of 100, that means that the number of preventable deaths in your hospital is the same as the national average, so it's a ratio. If your hospital is doing better than the national average and you have fewer preventable deaths, um, then your score will be under 100, so it's kind of like golf, the lower the score, the better. If your score is over 100, it means you have worse than the national average in terms of the number of preventable deaths. Um, now, what we did in our study was we looked at our preventable death rates for patients with pneumonia and COPD exacerbation because these are common diagnoses we treat in our hospital. There's clear evidence to guide how to treat these conditions. We have order sets that are particular to these diagnoses, and usually physicians can make this diagnosis fairly reliably at the point of care on admission. We took all, all of our patients who were uh, admitted with this diagnosis. Actually, we, uh, the chart poll that we did was related to the most responsible diagnosis on discharge. Uh, we took all of the charts that had those two diagnoses um, in seasonalized data before and after turning on our electronic system. So our population number one was based on paper-based care, and our population number two was based on electronic care. I won't show you the table one in the interest of time, but the groups were similar in age and gender distribution, um, as well as comorbidities, et cetera. And then we applied uh, statistical uh, corrections such as probability of death, which is a chi high uh, standard formula. It builds in Charlson weight, as well as um, factors such as sex and age, et cetera. Uh, so all of the factors, including comorbidities, are, are factored in. Um, what it does not correct for is critical care admission, so we actually independently corrected for that. Our primary hypothesis was that if we were to use an electronic system to care for our patients and we had electronic order entry and electronic order management, that we would actually have fewer preventable deaths in our hospital compared to when we were using paper. 
And the secondary hypothesis was that if we were to use a standardized order set that was specific to the diagnosis of that patient, that it would be more effective than using a generalized order set. So for example, if a patient came into hospital with pneumonia and I chose just a general admission order set which didn't have any specific evidence for that patient, would that patient do not as well as a patient who had a specific pneumonia order set used at the time of admission to hospital? And these are the results. So in the third line, uh, this is the most important line, this shows you the raw death rate um, adjusted for probability of death in critical care admission. The odds of dying in hospital from COPD exacerbation or pneumonia were 45% lower when we used CPOE and electronic care standards as opposed to when we were using paper and only semi-standardized care with a p-value of 0 0.005, strongly statistically significant. When we looked at our secondary hypothesis, so this second line shows you the most important data, when we, used, when we looked at the raw death rate and corrected for probability of death in critical care admission, it was 56% less likely that a patient would die in hospital from pneumonia or COPD exacerbation if the physician used an order set which matched the diagnosis of the patient on admission. So in other words, bringing that evidence to the point of care with a p-value of 0.024. But if the physician just chose any old order set, such as a general admission order set, or perhaps an order set that was close but didn't match the diagnosis. For example, they picked maybe an influenza order set when the patient actually had pneumonia or asthma exacerbation. There was no effect on mortality, and in some cases there were trends toward increased mortality. So what we think this shows is that standardizing care and um, building uh, that standardization into the workflow of clinicians has a profound effect on the, the outcomes that really matter to our patients. I mean, what's more important than having your loved one come home from the hospital rather than not? So this was very powerful to be able to feed back to our physicians and help them understand this system is making a difference for the care you provide. Here's our mortality data trended out over several years. So that red line of a standard uh, hospital standardized mortality ratio, the national average was, is 100, so that's the red line. You can see that when we were using a paper-based system that wasn't fully standardized, um, we were consistently worse than the national average with HSMR scores of around 105 to 120. But after we've turned on the electronic system, we've been consistently much better than the national average year over year. Um, the red arrow, number one, is when we turned on the electronic uh, standardized orders, and number two is where there was a government program to start helping hospitals to use standardized care uh, in their hospital. And you can see it didn't really have an effect because we had already standardized our care on best evidence. In terms of other outcomes of our system, this is an example of VTE prophylaxis. So this is prophylaxis against blood clots uh, in immobile patients in the hospital, which is a common and serious complication of hospitalization. Um, venous thromboembolism prevention is something that needs to be considered at the time of hospital admission. And um, back in 2007, when we had paper, um, Bill Geertz, who is one of the authors of the CHEST guidelines on how to prevent VTE in hospitals, did a, an, a, a study of several hospitals in, a, in Toronto area uh, to help find the hospitals that were doing well and those who were not. We were doing abysmally, and thankfully the Toronto Star never found this information, or they probably would have published it, but only about 17% of our medical patients were getting appropriate prophylaxis. Horrified with that result, we then um, started a quality improvement campaign. We educated our physicians of the importance of ET prophylaxis. We had a standardized order set for, on paper for prophylaxis, and we were able to get up to 65%. But as often happens with quality improvement programs, people move on to the next shiny apple and everyone forgets about that thing they were doing a few years ago and before you know it, the quality starts to fall off again. So by 2010, we were down to only 50% of our medical patients getting appropriate prophylaxis. When we turned on our electronic system in 2010, we had built um, modules for VT prophylaxis into every one of our admission order sets. And because that was built into the workflow, we immediately got up to 84%, which was better than we had ever achieved on paper. Shortly after that, we then introduced real-time clinical decision support to look for coded data on the chart to say, has this patient already had prophylaxis um, ordered uh, for their hospital stay, or was prophylaxis considered, but the physician decided not to order it because of a particular contraindication? If there were no coded data on the chart that pertained to any of those, then we assumed the physician had not considered VT prophylaxis and we provided a pop-up alert to remind them of the importance of considering that and help them order the appropriate um, 
prevention. So then we were able to get to 96%, and then with some further revisions to the alert, up to 97%. And this has been maintained year over year over year without anybody standing over the physician's keyboard and wrapping them on the wrist if they didn't do what they were told. This is about making quality stick. If you make it easy to do the right thing, then physicians will just do it. It becomes part of the standard of care. And then it's much easier to get the, the quality outcomes that you need year over year um, with this type of improvement. So I, I'm just going to summarize here because there isn't time to tell you about all the nuances of our system, but we were able to get 100% adoption and um, a survey a few months after turning on our system showed that 80% of our physicians were either satisfied or very satisfied with the system. Our medication reconciliation, which is another important quality indicator, improved from 8% to over 85% of our uh, medical patient population. Our medication turnaround time for stat antibiotics went from 291 to 50 minutes, that's an 83% improvement. This is important because, for example, if you come into hospital with pneumonia, there's evidence to show that the faster you get your antibiotic, the better you're going to do. Um, with our closed-loop medication system, we were able to prevent over 11,000 potential mismatch errors. So this was a situation where a nurse had some coded medications, was about to go into a four-bed patient room and give medications to a patient, and they didn't realize that Mr. Smith had moved to a different bed, and they were about to give those, patient, those medications to Mr. Jones. Of course, nobody ever means to do that, but the electronic system helps to prevent that type of error from happening. Uh, our VT prophylaxis improved, as I said before, from 50 to over 97% of patients, and we saw a concomitant reduction in our VTE uh, rates in our hospital by 39%. Our order set usage improved from about 36% on paper to over 97% on admission using our electronic system, which represents a cultural change in our organization. And our mortality data, of course, I think is uh, even more important, showing a 45% reduction in death in hospital from COPD exacerbation and pneumonia, and a 56% reduction if the correct order set is used at the time of admission. Um, now, I think clinical outcomes are the most important, but money uh, does become a factor as well. The data that you're looking at here is published um, in, our, in our country uh, because it shows what the average cost of an adverse event in a hospital is. And you can see that the numbers really start to add up. Um, a nosocomial VTE costs anywhere between $24,000 and $36,000 Canadian due to increased length of hospital stay and complications. Um, and so what we did is we measured in our system, just with four types of adverse events, the number of events we were able to prevent by introducing this electronic system with standardized data. And we were able to show that we were able to avert $38 million in cost over five years just from these four adverse events alone. And this actually represented more uh, saving than the money we spent to implement our system. So including the costs of implementation and maintenance and our staff and our hardware and our software it was about 37 million. So we actually save money. Now, this is cost aversion. It's not, it's on paper. It's not real money back in the bank. But nevertheless, it does show that there are some uh, ways to, to see real, uh, realize financial benefits from these systems as well. To me as a physician, of course, nothing is more important than saving lives. And I think even more important is showing that we saved over 150 lives from just pneumonia and COPD exacerbation alone over that five year period. So um, we've had some good results. We'd like to share this with the rest of our country and perhaps with your countries. What could we do to leverage what we've learned here on a bigger scale? So um, I wanna talk about the, the provincial and the national level now. Uh, and there's some exciting stuff that's going on. The unfortunate news is what I've just shown you is kind of like those diet or wrinkle ads. Um, our results are not typical. There are lots of hospitals that implement electronic health record systems. Most of them spend a whole lot of money and don't have a lot to show for it. And that's why there are only 50 organizations in the world that have won the Davies Award, uh, because it's actually more the exception than the rule to be able to show that these systems actually improve clinical outcomes. And the fact is that most Canadian hospitals are not particularly effective at integrating current evidence, standardized data into clinical workflows to get that data to the bedside and, and change the way we care for patients. And there are many reasons for this. First of all, our leaders don't understand the potential benefits of this type of system and how building standardization in from the get-go is a critical factor in getting these types of outcomes. Getting clinicians to the table to be part of the project so that they totally understand why the system is going to be used and they take ownership of it because they were at the table helping design it is another key factor. Having enough resources to build clinical content on top of the vendor software for 
clinical documentation templates and order sets, takes additional resources, not just during the implementation phase, but also in maintenance of the system, and most organizations don't allocate enough funding or human resources to make that happen. There's also a paucity, paucity of expertise in our country in terms of having the right people that can actually do this work. These projects often are technology focused rather than clinically focused and so the clinical transformation and standardization sort of gets bulldozed because people are just looking forward to, well, how do we get to the go live and install the software and that's the only goal. And we really don't build standards into the workflow. The other issue is that even for organizations that are successful in creating clinical content that changes practice, there's a huge amount of work to keep that content up to date. At North York General, we have four and a half full-time equivalent staff that are doing nothing but just updating order sets on a regular basis. We have 850 standardized order sets in our system now, and in a given year, about 350 of those are updated. That's a huge amount of work. And if you imagine that every organization, there are something like 650 hospitals in Canada, if every one of them is doing this work individually, that's a lot of duplicate work, and it probably doesn't make sense for every hospital to be doing this on their own. The other reason why this clinical content that I've mentioned is so important is because it's what makes the difference between hospitals that don't really have any great outcomes and the ones that do, even though they're using the same vendor software. And what's interesting is also the savings that happen when you have good clinical content because the clinical content is what changes clinical decisions. So this report here, uh, this is a study published by Hillestad in 2005, it shows what the potential savings might be, now this is for the US, so you have to divide by 10 when you're thinking about Canada, but nevertheless, when people think about electronic systems, they often think about that the savings are, well, we don't have to shuffle paper around anymore, and we don't have to scan charts, and we don't have to uh, run down to the film lab to get results anymore. Everything is electronic and transmissible. Actually, only about 24% of the financial benefit of these systems is coming from that type of automation. And where the real lion's share of the benefit comes from is actually in changing clinical decisions. It's the clinical data and the clinical uh, content in the system that is changing decisions at the point of care that make a difference to clinical outcomes and also financial costs. So 76% of that financial benefit is actually uh, in that type of information. So better clinical decisions are our goal here because the most expensive tool used in medicine is still the doctor's pen or keyboard and mouse, depending on how you look on it. So what we've done at, at a provincial level in Canada now is to try to leverage the benefits of a publicly funded jurisdiction. So this is different from the US where every hospital is competing against one another for patients. In our country and probably many of your countries, our problem is accommodation. How do we deal with all this tsunami of patients that are coming into our hospital and need care? Well, if we could share the work and share the knowledge that we've already developed, we could probably um, provide, do more with less. So we've created a team of individuals from our hospital as well as another, uh, actually the only other Davies Award winning hospital in Canada. And we have experienced informaticians and clinicians which are now going to other hospitals in the province and providing on-site mentorship and peer-to-peer -peer support to help them through all the different aspects of implementing these systems. Everything from creating project governance structures to implementation strategies, clinician engagement, and also the importance of using standardized clinical data, and that means including using SNOMED CT. Now, keep in mind that 80% of hospitals in my province of Ontario have not yet implemented advanced systems. So there's a huge need for this type of knowledge right now. There's a lot of investment going on in the next five years to implement these systems across our province. And we can, we can provide a lot of value with a very small and cost-efficient team sharing that information and building trust and relationships on the ground with each hospital to help them in the early decisions in their projects that make a key difference to the outcomes a few years down the road. In the first nine months, we've actually assisted over 50 hospitals in this work, and the feedback has already been tremendous, where there's been examples that we have affected crucial clinical decisions at the early, or pardon me, even just financial or administrative decisions, early on in an implementation project that are going to have profound impacts downstream for that hospital. The other piece is, when I talk about the, the benefit of this clinical content, such as order sets and templates, 
is how are, we, how are we going to democratize that process of creating clinical content so that North York General isn't doing that by itself and University Health Network isn't doing that by itself, but rather at a provincial level can we create content that can be used in any hospital information system in the province. Now, this little picture up here is showing a, uh, a clinical handbook for community-acquired pneumonia that was published by Qu uh, Health Quality Ontario. Health Quality Ontario is an organization which, which uh, has started to create um, quality standards for specific diagnoses. This is similar to perhaps some work that's already been done in the UK or the US to say, well, if you have a patient with pneumonia, what are the key things that you need to do for that patient in, ever, in, able to provort, uh, in order to provide quality clinical care? Now, they found that these handbooks were being implemented in a very heterogeneous fashion between hospitals because it was essentially an 80-page book with all of this stuff in it, and everyone had to interpret what that meant for how their hospital was going to work. So what they did was they created a program that, um, that basically created paper order sets that would then build in all these quality standards for hospital to use. But the problem with that is, number one, Hospitals are all aiming to use electronic systems, not paper. So how does that translate to an electronic system? And more importantly, they were using the order set as the only way to enact and measure quality standards. But as you probably already know, order sets are not the only tool that we use in clinical care. So although some orders, so what we're seeing here, there's an order for electrolytes and creatinine, yes, that is part of a quality standard for pneumonia, and that's easily measured against an order set. But there's also another quality standard that says that patients who have pneumonia should be vaccinated against influenza um, as well as um, pneumococcus. Now, you could put that in an order set and say, okay, pneumococcus vaccine, check mark, and you could measure against whether physicians check off that box, but that's not a good measure of, what, of quality care because that patient may not be getting a vaccine because they've already had the vaccine or they refuse the vaccine, or they have a contraindication, or they're gonna be getting it from their family doctor in two weeks. Maybe they're too sick to get it when they first come into hospital. So putting this all in an admission order set, it's kind of like if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and that's probably not the best way to work. This would be much better implemented in a clinical documentation template, and we could measure much higher quality data if we standardized the clinical documentation template around did the patient get the vaccine and why or why not. So there's a fair bit of translation work that needs to be done here to take the paper-based content, standardize it, and build it into hospital information systems. And this is very time and resource intensive for every hospital to do. The other problem is that in our country, and I don't know if this is true for yours as well, but most of the content in our clinical systems is not standardized. So we don't, although every hospital that has an electronic system may have an order catalog, that order catalog is different from one hospital to the next. And so how do you have a standardized way of getting these quality standards to the front line? So here's what we're doing in Ontario now. And I think this is pretty exciting. Um, it's a little complex, so let me try to take you through it. Here we have the clinical quality standards that I just talked about. So for example, that pneumonia standard that I showed you that's published by Health Quality Ontario. So here's the little handbook. We know that that handbook is, is being interpreted heterogeneously and is not being implemented very well at the front line in a standardized way. So we're creating a new center for hospital information systems, clinical standards and outcomes. This organization is centrally based in the province and actually does that knowledge translation. We have people here who are experts in terminology and health information systems to take that paper-based standard and translate it into individual nuggets that would be built into a hospital information system. So that vaccination standard that I told you about would be built into a clinical documentation template, which would be a prototype to, to build into a hospital information system. Uh, the one around the electrolytes would be built into an order set. Another one about a quality standard for a follow-up visit for the patient for pneumonia who has a primary care physician, that would be built into a discharge template. Another one around selecting empiric antibiotics might be built into a real-time clinical decision support alert. So by building these standards and these little prototypes of nuggets that can be built into the different tools we have in hospital information systems, we can then start to standardize how, this, how these quality uh, elements are consumed into a hospital information system and also measured. Now, key to this is the use of SNOMED CT because what we're doing in order to standardize the content that we're providing to individual hospitals is we're encoding all of that data with SNOMED CT. The reason why that's important is because when we get down to the vendor level, so here we have vendor A, B, C, and D, for example. Right now in Ontario, we have three main hospital vendors and they're all a little bit different in the way that they work. 
Um, we've created um, vendor-based collaboratives, which means that all the people who are on vendor A in the province, pardon me, all the organizations in, in the province that are on vendor A are gonna be part of one collaborative. All the uh, hospitals that are part of vendor B are on another collaborative and so forth. In those collaboratives, we are building um, clinical standardization so that we have a clinical reference model for how the pieces and parts of that hospital information system are going to be built and used in the province. So we have, what we're working on now is actually creating standardized order catalogs that are all underpinned by SNOMED CT terms. Same for our clinical documentation elements. So what this allows us to do is now we've got, no matter if the frontline free text clinical language says urinary catheter in one hospital and Foley catheter in another hospital, it's okay because the underlying map term is the same. So we now have all these um, uh, templates and pieces that are flowing down into the vendor specific uh, collaboratives, which already have the um, standardized clinical elements in their system. And with a little bit of adjustment for content fit, whereas uh, one hospital or one vendor works versus another, for example, the clinical decision support scripting might be a little different in one vendor versus another, we're then able to get this content out to the frontline hospitals, uh, which are uh, arranged in clusters. Now, because all of the content that we're bringing to the front line is standardized, we can also now measure in a standardized way. So we're able to take all the standardized outcome data, which is now mapped to SNOMED CT, and feed it back to our Center for Clinical Standards and Outcomes to revise the design in an agile development manner. So this knowledge translation uh, organization is not meant to be this huge government behemoth that takes two years to create a clinical standard. It's more of an agile development approach where they're very quickly creating um, a prototype content that gets down to the front line, gets to the hospital, we test it out, and then we get rapid feedback to say, how's that working, how do we adjust it? Now, uh, aside from how well did clinicians adopt it, we're also getting um, the, uh, the outcome data that helps us understand how well are we doing against our quality standards. So how often is that patient who comes in with pneumonia actually getting a vaccine, or perhaps it was contraindicated, was considered, and was actively not chosen? So uh, in summary then, what we have at a provincial level is we have, we're, we're aiming for this province-wide iterative health quality improvement using electronic systems. We have that um, expert team that I told you about that's providing on-site peer-to-peer assistance. We have the vendor-based collaboratives that are building clinical reference models for how a standard hospital in Ontario will use a particular vendor software, and that includes encoding things like templates and uh, order catalogs in SNOMED CT terms. Then we're using knowledge translation and measurement, as I showed you, to take the paper-based standards and make them into nuggets that work in a hospital information system. And lastly, very importantly, hospitals, you know, they all know what's good for them, but again, it's like eating your vegetables. If you don't have sort of a benefit or a or penalty at the end of the road, it's hard to get people to follow the right path. So we're also building a maturity model in that is not like the hims MRAM, which is just about what technology you've implemented, but rather what are the, the key pieces that are in your system that garner clinically relevant outcomes. And if the hospitals are complying, they will get incentives or bonuses. And if they're not complying, they'll get penalties. So they need to um, conform to using these standards and using the provincially generated content in order to get um, the bonuses on that maturity model. So in closing, um, I've told you about the past. We came from a world where we had some cantankerous and frustrated toddlers, i.e. physicians, that didn't want to eat their vegetables and use SNOMED CT into the present where now there's an understanding that there's a benefit. They're starting to see some clinical outcomes that make a difference in using coded and uh, um, uh, clinical data. And we're able to move from that idea of stealth use to regular open uh, use in front of clinicians. And in the future that we're just generating now with this new model that I've shown you, we're able to leverage the benefits of a publicly funded system to do peer-to-peer -peer mentorship of hospitals that have already done well to hospitals that are just starting on the journey. Um, creating standardized building blocks for uh, the hospital information systems we use in our province that are encoded in SNOMED CT. Centralizing quality focused content development that can then move into the hospital information systems. And because that content is standardized, we can then in a closed loop fashion measure the outcomes and then iteratively improve. And we feel this could be a translatable approach for other publicly funded jurisdictions, perhaps where you come from as well. So I'll close there and take some questions. I'm only going to allow one question because our time is uh, 
running out and we need to close this session down. But uh, please, can I ask one person to ask uh, a key question? <laughs> you have no responsibilities? How, how about you, Dr. Fritzma? How are you going to take this on in America? We need a question. So Jeremy, thank you. Um, the work that you've done is really remarkable. Um, as you think about scaling this and going from a hospital or a region to a nation or even a big nation, what do you see as challenges that aren't going to translate from your current approach or new ways that you're going to have to think about it as this scales? Thank you for that question. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges of this approach is that um, in order for these systems, advanced systems, to be adopted meaningfully at a local level, clinicians need to have their fingerprints on the content. So as we've probably already seen in some examples um, in other jurisdictions where content is all designed centrally and then forced down on clinicians, uh, the results are not so great. So um, what, what needs to happen is there needs to be that, that central um, content creation, but the clinicians at a local level still need to be able to touch it, to feel it, and maybe make some small adjustments without disrupting the overall intent of the content. Um, that's certainly been our experience so far, because this model is actually not just conceptual, we're already doing it. Um, so there's a group, for example, in the northeast of our province, which has 24 hospitals all on one vendor, and they've already realized the benefits of standardization they're all implementing together. Now, that may not seem too remarkable in the United States, where there are lots of hospitals that are uh, already um, implementing systems in a chain, and there may be 20 or 30 hospitals all working together. But the important difference is those hospitals are all under the same corporate leadership. Whereas the hospitals that I'm talking about in Ontario are all independently managed. They have their own boards, they have their own clinicians, their own decision makers. So it's a much bigger deal for them to be on board with, um, with sharing this approach and this content. Um, and just as recently as last week, we've now connected another group of hospitals in a different region of the province, another six hospitals that are using that same vendor as the 24 hospitals, and now we're getting them to collaborate and cooperate. Now, we're sweetening the deal with a little bit of money in the pot to help them do this because they recognize it might slow down their implementation project, but they realize the benefit and they're willing to give it a shot. So, some thoughts on that. Jeremy, thank you very much. Can we just raise our hands once more to Jeremy to thank him for his presentation? I'm sure he'll be having coffee with us, so for those of you who do have additional questions, he can line up. So it's now my pleasure to welcome uh, Peter Bielik, who's the Executive Director for the National Information uh, Center in Slovakia, uh, to round out this session. Thank you very much. I think we're just setting up your uh, slides. Okay, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me introduce firstly myself uh, my name is Peter Bielik. Uh, I am the, the executive uh, director of, uh, of uh, uh, and a member of uh, the board of directors in the National of, uh, Center Information Health uh, Center. I'm sorry, apologies. <laughs> Unfortunately, our general director, Mr. Blaskovic, can't be here, so I'm, I will cover this presentation. Uh, we are very happy uh, to have so many of you here in Bratislava. I, I know whole week was very interesting for, for you uh, to share many kind of information uh, on SNOMED. And uh, I would like to briefly uh, provide you for a few more information about our national health information system, so-called e-health here in Slovakia. Uh, so uh, I will start, firstly, we called uh, our e-health in Slovakia uh, as a e -Zdravie, which is uh, closer to Slovakia nations, to Slovak citizens. So we changed the brand uh, e-health to e uh, which is more understandable for, for, for our citizens, as mentioned. And also, uh, e-health was, ju was just one part uh, from what was uh, started before. Let me slowly jump to the next slide. Okay. 
uh, what is our vision uh, and goals. So as you can see, our vision is to provide right information in the right time, in the right place, in all stages and processes of healthcare to the public. Uh, and you see goals, a significant contribution of information and communication technologies to healthcare improvement and promotion of life quality for all citizens. Just uh, slowly, where we started uh, with e-health in Slovakia, uh, we were Previous government started uh, with e-health already in 2007. Uh, there were many changes, and our new team here in the National Health Information Center started since March 2016. Uh, okay. Here you can see on this slide you can see. Uh, some more details about system roles in provision of electri electronic health care. You can see healthcare providers. We have hospitals, we have doctor offices, pharmacies, ambulances, lab laboratories, and this is something which you also have everywhere, I, I assume, of in each country. In the middle, you can see our national health information system, which is the, the most important part for, for uh, our, uh, our citizens. And uh, we, are, we are planning to implement, uh, since 1st uh, January 2018, few, few modules. I will provide you more details in, an, in the next slides. As you can see on the right-hand side, uh, there is uh, also so-called uh, national portal, national healthcare portal, NPZ in Slovak. And whole citizens uh, since 1st January 2018 will be able to see his, uh, his uh, records uh, from GPs and from specialists. So this is our aim to provide uh, uh, electronic uh, details to, to whole citizens and to, to share this information on one system. In the middle you see a national health information system. And uh, from... Uh, which uh, system consists? Uh, it's uh, electronic prescription, electronic health record of the citizens, national patient portal, supporting system, uh, e-medication, and e-labs. Um, we are also to planning, uh, for sure, to implement uh, new changes, but uh, since 1st of January, we are planning uh, to implement just three modules, as mentioned already, e-prescription, e-medical, uh, and e-labs. But our plans is, uh, in the near future, also implement more, more uh, functionalities, which will be closer to citizens, which will help uh, to doctors, and which will help to, to, to specialists to share uh, those information to, to, to provide more or, or better, let's say, uh, let's say it, uh, healthcare to citizens. This is the main uh, goal and main aim of, of our, uh, our, uh, our plans, okay? Uh, just as slowly, what's the situation in Slovakia now? Uh, assume in uh, most of countries in Slovakia, oh, I'm sorry, most of European countries is the same. And uh, usually uh, citizens or patients take his uh, paperwork from, from GPs and uh, run from one doctor to the, to the other one. And uh, this is something uh, which is, uh, let's say, Mm, most complicated for, for them, uh, take time, and it's not uh, user-friendly, so-called, and uh, we are planning to avoid this kind of situation. So that's why we are here. That's, uh, that's the, the goal of uh, our, our uh, institution. And uh, as mentioned, we are here since 2016. Uh, we came with new government, and this is the, the new government goal. And, and, and the way of work. Okay, let's me move forward. Here you can see also some uh, functionalities and integration. It was uh, just mentioned, but uh, the most discussed part of the system was the structure the, of the patient summary. The structure was the, derived from the outcomes of uh, the international EPSOS project from the it, is, it was uh, the European project from the recommendation of eHealth Network and the structure of the, the, our patient summary is defined by our national e-health law. We are also planning, uh, or not planning, there are also some, some changes, legislative changes, uh, which uh, will uh, help us, but not only us as an organization, but also to the doctors to, to 
to, to make his work much more better and provide the right information you know, on the right time uh, uh, to, 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 to take the better care of our patients. <clears throat> okay, let me move forward. Yeah, here you can see, for example, our card. This is the so-called EPZP card, uh, uh, which will be provide, uh, provided to the doctors. They will uh, identify themselves uh, through the system, uh, and, uh, and uh, also we are providing them card and the card reader enabling online check through the healthcare registers. And uh, this card uh, we have in Slovakia 110,000 uh, 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 doctors and sisters and uh, uh, and and uh, medical uh, insurances. I'm sorry, thank you. And uh, healthcare workers, and each of them has his ID, which is uh, presenting in our system. So we are we are able to to see who checked your 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 uh, your ebook e when you you can see the logs from from your your card so this is the, this is also the aim just to avoid some uh, because of this sensitive data just to avoid uh, to share or or uh, store this kind of information from uh, from the systems uh, i think our system is uh, really well secured we have some certification, so we are not afraid of uh, uh, of uh, this kind of hacker attacks. Uh, so, so for now we are okay and with this. Okay, let me move forward. Uh, he was already mentioned patient summary. What you can see within it. So for GPs, uh, they shall fill in the summary with the key patient data following the legislative guidelines, as, as, as you see here, uh, active implants, allergies, vaccination, et cetera, blood type, which can also, also be uh, most important for, for uh, first aid and uh, for, for the healthcare sharing. <clears throat> okay. And of course, the physician are obliged to fill it uh, every patient when possible. Okay, let me move forward. Here you can see you already mentioned that's your healthcare portal, which uh, or where whole or each citizen can find his uh, his uh, so-called ebook with many details. As you see, it's a. Uh, I don't want to go into the, the, the technical details how it works, but uh, 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 if you would like to know more, we can provide or our colleagues uh, provide you more details and maybe share this uh, this uh, portal with you right after this presentation. So this is the layout, and we are also planning to change change this layout because this is uh, so-called old-fashioned. We are planning to implement uh, uh, social networks as, uh, to be to be also more user-friendly, let's say, because of new technologies, new social networks like Facebook, etc. So we are also planning to change our core system inside. Uh, as mentioned, we are here just the first uh, one and a half year, so which is not easy to, to change many things like a legislation, like our systems. So, but this is our aim for 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 next period also planning to use some mobile phone cells uh, and uh, mobile applications so this is our aim in the near future but for sure uh, as mentioned these information are really sensitive we need to be careful how to provide how to share this information and this is the main point also for us and on the next slide you can also see how it looks like as mentioned but for now, for, since 1st of January, uh, we are planning to use this, uh, this, uh, uh, this um, platform, but in the future, for sure, this is our next, next goal, to change this. Okay. <clears throat> On this slide, you can see deployment of electronic healthcare. You see also how many hospitals, how many ambulances uh, we have in Slovakia. Uh, so uh, there are uh, there are many of them ambulances. For example, uh, eight and a half thousand. Uh, as we are small country, 
comparing others. Uh, we have just 158 uh, eight hospitals. Some of them are uh, private ones, some of them for sure also state-owned. We have 88 state-owned uh, hospitals, and uh, the rest is, uh, is mentioned private ones. And uh, in Slovakia, uh, I would like just, just to mention one, one more point. Of, um, we are planning to integrate and deployment of IDs with hospitals. This is also a system which we are not uh, implementing by ourselves, I mean from, from, from ENSYS point of view, but this is the governmentally uh, led uh, EID card. So we are not implementing our card. Uh, but this, is, this will be taken from the government uh, decision, also used for, for other ministries and on other, other sectors. So this will be shared also through, through our systems. <clears throat> and as you see, deployment in 2016 is aimed of healthcare providers ready for connection. And this is the, the main group. As mentioned, we have uh, 110 uh, providers, and uh, we, what is not easy for us uh, because we are not uh, not the company who is providing the systems to the doctors in Slovakia, but we have uh, 46 vendors, which is not easy sometimes to work with them because uh, th there is a, there is a, there is a legislation, but you know it's it's not easy to implement very quickly this because of you know because of amount of work because of amount also of budget. Et we are not, uh, our organization is not, uh, uh, I don't want to say uh, support them, but we are not paying them the money for, for changing their system because of our needs. So we are uh, providing them uh, information via our portals, via, via our, 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 our ways of works, and also we are changing legislation to, to support this. But we are also cooperating with, uh, closely with them. Uh, and explaining them what we are uh, uh, trying to achieve and how we are trying to achieve, which is sometimes not easy. Sometimes they are listening to us, but sometimes because of money, because of uh, many other uh, problems, they are not, uh, let's say they are against us, which is not easy. But of course, because of, uh, because of communication with them, since we came into this, uh, this, uh, this role, it's, it's, let's say, from my point of view, it's, it's, uh, it's better, it's, it's changing for sure. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> let's, let me move to the, to the next slide. And uh, last but not least, for sure, you can see here the key goals. What is the the we are we are uh, trying to to achieve here? What is the the benefits for for providers? What is the benefit for for patients? It's it's uh, quick access to medical data, increasing quality of provider healthcare, and I can read through this, but this is everywhere in each country the same because of patient for us is on the first first uh, first uh, place. So this is something we would like to achieve in cooperation with uh, vendors, in cooperation with doctors. Sometimes it's not easy because doctor get used to to work uh, with papers, you know, because of. Uh, how to say, they, they don't want to be responsible for something they write down, and something, you know, this can be some kind of uh, evidence, uh, who make what, and I think you understand this, and this is something they are, some of them are trying to, to, to be negatively set to, to our goals or to, to our mission, but uh, I think with uh, new doctors, they, they understand uh, what, what are our plans, and uh, we can't stay in the uh, 20th century, but uh, we would like to move forward to the 21st and also share this, this information, not uh, just within, Euro uh, within Slovakia, but within European Union, and maybe in the future also in the worldwide. So, so this is, uh, I mean, the worldwide goal to share this, this information because uh, many Slovaks also travel around the world and uh, you should have your information, uh, I mean your, your, uh, your e-book uh, with you anytime if you have some problem uh, everywhere. So this is, this is something we would like to achieve and this is the main goal and uh, we hope and I assume that also uh, many other countries uh, uh, to, to achieve this. 
Okay, so what else? It was just a quickly before your your break. Uh, so this is uh, everything from my side. And if you have a uh, few more questions, we will be glad to provide you more details right after this presentation. I have here uh, our specialist for, for, from uh, from uh, many kind of uh, sectors. So we will be able and glad to provide you this kind of information. And uh, last but not least, I hope you had a nice uh, nice time, nice week here in Bratislava. I heard many of you were here longer than just a week. So and probably you will take uh, one more. <laughs> I hope weather was orange right for you. And uh, so I hope you, you have a nice time. And uh, I just can say to, to to have a safe journey to your homes. Thank you very much. Peter, thank you very much for that introduction to uh, Slovakian uh, health systems and to your e-record. I'm sure your patients must love that e-book. So thank you very much for showing that. Uh, and thank you so much for hosting us in Slovakia. We have indeed enjoyed our week. Thank you very much. Thank you.